I teach architecture, um, and I've been doing that for quite a length of time. Um, and one of the things I want to do in this talk really is to kind of bring together two aspects of my life. One is the teaching of architecture, and the other is the involvement in Tactility Factory. And I want to do those two things and somehow make sense of that, and then to see if that helps to move forward in, uh, in Northern Ireland. So the other part of my life is being co-director of Tactility Factory. Let me just see. Um, and uh, in that, I'm in a collaboration with T uh, Trish Belfort, who's in the audience. Um, and Trish is a textile designer, and I'm an architect, of course. Trish and I both have very different motivations for doing the things that we do. Um, I am motivated out of a kind of critique of the built environment. I'm interested in the fact that sometimes we're guilty of making spaces, and I have to say, this isn't one of them, but we're guilty of making spaces that are hostile to people, that don't welcome people, and that are sterile or harsh or hard or cold and all of those things. So I'm interested to know why we do that. And I'm particularly through Tactility Factory uh, driven to kind of bring design and design quality and an understanding of people in space back further into the fabrication of the products that make up the built environment. So that's one of the things that we do. And I, 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 it's, it's my kind of core motiv motivation. Of course, when you're in collaboration with other people, you have to give space for everybody's motivation, don't you? You have to make sure that everybody has a place from which they are driven. Um, Trish's are entirely different, and I, I respect them. But where we do overlap is that we're both essentially really passionate about the outcomes. We share that kind of driven passion and engagement with what we do. And of course, what we do is we make hard things soft. Um, essentially, what that is, is that we use all of her wisdom <laughs> and all of her years of, of skill, all of her skills and all of her years of experience by trying to integrate textiles and textile technologies onto the surface of concrete. So it's fully, and fully embedded, it's totally integral, and it's a permanent thing, okay? Um, and that's how we do it. So we're using textile and textile techniques, really, to do that. Um, and that's kind of key. We have tested all of the yarns, all of the fabrics, and over the last five years, in fact, we've been working together for six years, but for five years, we were working very much in R&D, um, and it took us a long time to get the technology just right. And now we've achieved that. Um, the uses, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I'm not really here to talk about Tactility Factory as a thing, but more as a, as a way to think, I suppose. But the uses are that we can create uh, architectural elements like friezes, we can apply it to a wall surface, but we can also make skins, which are very thin elements, and we can then uh, cast that into precast concrete um, in situ or um, precast concrete elements um, that also have a structural application. So walls, the underside of uh, floor slabs or uh, balustrades or whatever. So there, there's kind of wide range that the place that we can use the technology in. Um, what I now want to do is kind of talk around three themes, three themes that I think overlap both with my teaching and also the experience of being in, in uh, Tactility Factory. And then, excuse me, see if any of those themes resonate with you and whether they might be something that we can do together in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Okay, so the first one is making mad ideas sane. In fact, I think we put this as a strap line to the kind of uh, the, the information to do with this uh, event. And Trish and I have come to understand that that's maybe what we do. We make mad ideas sane. Um, it's a very utopian statement. I suppose that's the polite way of, of calling it. Uh, but in fact, it's also just a bit bonkers, I suppose. Um, and one could be a bit more rude about what it, what it is. Um, uh, but of course, it is done with, uh, with purpose, and we're doing it strategically. We are deliberately intending to make mad ideas sane. And one of the things that I do in my own design teaching whenever I'm working with students is really to engage them in that process, that journey of thinking about utopian ideas or mad ideas. Just double checking, double te you know, testing whether that's possible. Because the journey towards utopia, whilst it's not possible and we'll never get there, is a very rich journey and it's full of a masses of amounts of disappointment 
and, uh, and false outcomes and blind alleyways, but it's also very full of potential and open horizons and new ideas and new, new way of thinking. It, it brings you to spaces you would normally never go to. Okay? Now, it's not for everybody, and I really understand that, and in fact, it's not for every single student. Um, but what it is, is, is something that creative practitioners engage with on a daily basis. And I would also argue that it's something that academics need to engage with on a daily basis. We need to be thinking that long journey. We need to be up ahead to scout out before the rest of us come after them. As part of that process, uh, you have to understand that Trish and I can engage with it, I suppose, and, and most people who are creative uh, practitioners can, because we're experienced because we've done it before, because we've done and faced big issues before, and we've really kind of addressed that in our own life. Um, and so we employ quite a lot of bravery. Some people would call it naivety, maybe, I don't know. Um, but we also employ, uh, uh, we're fastidious, we're persistent, and we're also really rigorous in what we do. And rigor is fundamental to being creative. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that is really important for where we're going. We have two tactics, sorry, we have two tactics in what we do. Well, we have lots of tactics in what we do, but there's only two that I want to talk about. And the first is, um, and it, we'll see how this flies, but the first is um, shifting media. Uh, and shifting media is something we do quite a lot. We change forms of representation quite a lot. I think that's because we just are people who work across a whole range of things. So we work across image making, and that can be digital image making, it can be analog, Trish also uses collage. We also make uh, prototypes. We're also uh, working with text. I write a lot about the things that we do. We blog a lot about the things we do. We engage as much as possible. We've used animation to tell the story of what we do. And interestingly, the other thing, and I never thought I'd say this, and Trish probably doesn't believe I'm gonna say this either, but, but we also find the process of writing patterns to be really, really crucial to how we formulate it and move forward in what we do, because we've got about three patterns on our technology. And that shifting of means of representation and looking at what you do from a whole range of angles, even looking at it from the marketing angle, looking at it from just, you know, like I write academic papers, all of that helps us to really focus on what it is we do and be strong in our conceptual ground. I think that's really key. And again, it's something that I teach a lot to architecture students. Um, because representation isn't just what we have in our head, it is the process by which we take that idea and we then see it in a different format whenever it's out there. So representation is also a way to test, to craft, to carve out, to really further understand how, how we move an idea forward. And that, and that for us is really important. The second tactic that we do, and I call it, um, it's called moving and managing critique, okay? Now, critique is central to being creative. It's right at the core of what we do. In, in many ways, I understand it as being, it's a sister to creativity, and it sits together on the periodic table of creativity right side by side, okay? So they sit together. And you can't be one without the other. And for architecture and for my poor students, we have this horrendous form of critique, which we call the crit, where the students will pin up their work and uh, I, I, would, I was gonna say invite staff to make comments, but they don't have to invite them. The staff get stuck into that process. Um, and it's difficult, you know, it's harrowing. It's, uh, it causes them to lose balance sometimes and to you know, misunderstand how to do that. Uh, and to move forward. And actually, one of the things I also teach is how to manage critique. Because it's not just enough to go seeking it, and it's not just enough to exercise critique in your own work. It is how you then manage it, and use it, and move on from it. And for me, actually, that's where rigor comes into a creative approach. Okay, so that's where we're putting rigor into being creative. It being creative. It's not in kind of coming up with the ideas, it's how we then manage the process of critique and moving on within that process that I'm interested in. Um, okay, so here's the second theme, it's lineage, right? I also think this is really crucial to what we do in Tactility Factory and it's also really crucial to where we're going uh, in Northern Ireland. I think, I hope, I hope, I hope. Um, 
We work obviously with, this is linen and concrete, so that's a linen surface and, and the co concrete kind of bubbles coming up to the surface. Um, and linen's fantastic, we love linen. Linen's fantastic for lots of reasons, um, not only because it's a cellulose-based fabric, fibre, and it exists, in fact, it sits very nicely and very at home within concrete and alkaline environment, but it is also great to be part of the story of linen, because it's a great Irish, Northern Irish fabric. Okay, and it's really good for us to reinterpret that and to allow other people to see linen being used in other contexts. And we really love that. That's a great thing to, to respond to. In fact, linen and concrete is becoming our new vinegar and chips. I think it marries so well together. It's almost as if, how did nobody else come up with it? It just looks so good together. They work so well, it's as if they really are married in there. And I think what's nice about the idea of vinegar and chips is that vinegar is a wee bit acidic, right? So it makes reference back to the idea, uh, that idea of, crit uh, of critique. So it's a wee bit acidic on, on, the, the, on the chips, but nevertheless, I think that's, that's great. The other great thing about concrete, we use concrete, of course, is that concrete is this ubiquitous, and it's a wonderful word, global material. It's very low tech, it's very accessible. Um, and consequently, it's used in a whole range of applications. I mean, it really is fantastic, a brilliant substance. But as my mother would say, it has a few wee flaws, okay? And those flaws are, and this is kind of also the thing that's good about it, is that it's cold and it's grey. I love the fact it's grey. I love grey. But it's also, um, yeah, cold grey and it's acoustically harsh. Okay, so it's quite difficult to put it onto a surface in an interior because it really re the space really resonates around that. So it's not great. Um, and what we do is we expand, I think, uh, the characteristics of concrete. So we can make it colourful, we can make it warm, and we can make it acoustically soft. And, and, and that's great, isn't it? That's kind of working off an already brilliant substance and making it even better. Um, so. We're working with two indigenous uh, industries, concrete and textiles, indigenous to Northern Ireland and a fantastic lineage to make reference to, a fantastic lineage to move forward from, a wealth of experience. And what we do is another design tactic that I teach my students, which is cross-programming. That's where you bring, you know, if you're sitting within a, a design and you, there's two things that don't look as if they're going to work together, the, the kind of response is to move them far apart. And what I encourage people to do is actually just bring them a wee bit closer together to see what then evolves out of that. And again, it's that word interface, and a word that we're really familiar with here in Northern Ireland as well. What is the interface? Do we separate them out? <laughs> do we keep them well apart? Or do we allow, just allow to see what evolves out of that little bit of friction? And of course, there's lots of people that I talk to in, in the creative industry and in creative practice who would say that at the core of creativity is some sense of conflict. I mean, I've heard it said so many times. Um, and I think that's what's really interesting, that we cross-program. And when you cross-program something like uh, the concrete industry and the textile industry together, um, it's a great place to innovate from. It's, you know, it's a natural place to innovate out of, isn't it? I mean, it's a natural legacy, a natural body of expertise that we can take forward. Um, and one of the things that we are interested in is the outcome. Now, the outcome when you cross-fertilise anything, we all know there can be an aberration that's born. It can be an ugly baby, right? <laughs> but the good thing is that when you put design right at the point of conception, okay, not at the delivery part, but when you put des design and designers, and designers of the calibre that I work with, then the outcome is something that's functional, and it's integral, and it's healthy and bouncing, and it's also beautiful, right? And I think that that is what's profoundly interesting about bringing design and creative practice further and further back into the process of development. So it's not an add-on in that sense. Um, my last point, so I, I hope I'll finish in time, is really to do with well-made things, okay? Again, I really make reference here to the past and the, and the lineage and the background of what it is to be Northern Irish and what it is to make Nor what, the things that we produce, okay? And I'm thinking here of the Massey Ferguson, 
of the cranes of the Samson and Goliath, of the boat, of the shipbuilding, and I'm thinking of the hand-stitched linen handkerchiefs that were made en masse across the households of Northern Ireland and sent off around the world. And I'm also thinking, because I'm an architect, of the beautiful, muscular, red brick buildings that sit in the centre of our city and the detailing of those buildings. Well-made buildings and it's an attitude of being, doing things well-made. And I really like that. I think that's a fantastic culture. It's something that we really resonate with in Tactility Factory. Um, it's something that I really want to exploit and move on from. But I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago because this idea is a raw idea. I'm presenting a really raw idea to you today. So this could, this could pancake out, as I said, this could go nowhere. But um, I had a conversation with Terry from Terry Furniture about a week or so ago, and I was talking about this notion of well-made, and Terry said, yeah, no, 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 but Ruth, it's not enough. It's not enough to be well-made, because well-made, as you know, can end up with something that's really ugly and inappropriate and untimely and lacking a vision, can't it? Yeah. So we've decided that what we need to be is designed and well-made. <laughs> That's what we want to do. We want a title, we want a badge that says designed and well-made in Northern Ireland, because I think well-made is a great brand. Um, and the great thing about design is that whereas, whereas the idea of well-made, when something is well-made, it it's kind of introverted. It's an, we're coming to the end. It's a very introverted process, isn't it? You know that that's been an intimate relationship between the person who's thought of it or the people or the method of manufacture or whatever. That's very focused, it's very crafted. It's about care, it's about pride, but it can be very introverted, okay? The good thing about design is that it is strategic, it is long-term, and it is about looking for opportunities in the marketplace. It is about looking for opportunities to bring that well-made thing further and make it more relevant and also communicate the value of the well-made made thing. And I think ultimately that's what we want to do. And that's what I communicate with my students on a daily basis. And I want them to become creative practitioners who can in, uh, uh, get involved with an idea of being doing well-made design. Um, and I'd like to think that the audience tonight, this evening, this afternoon, um, would be able to help build that context for creative practice. Thank you very much.